Hi everyone, Dr. Raj here. And I'm very excited that I'm here in wonderful Pasadena, California in the Kaplan Center. And we have a special treat for everyone around the country tonight. We're gonna to talk about a subject that's very passionate to me and will help you on the board exam. The topic is sleep. So let me ask everyone who's listening right now, do you have good sleep? Well, I don't know. So if you're in the East Coast watching this, you're probably not sleeping. So it's good that you're watching this title. So when we talk about sleep, what jumps to mind? Well, you know, I think of classic phrases that actually we've lived by. How many people have heard of this? The early bird gets the worm. How many people heard of this one? Well, I could sleep when I'm dead. So it almost seems like sleep deprivation for some people is like wearing a badge of courage that yeah i'm not getting any sleep and i know when i think about society in general we spend so much time exercising trying to watch our diet but you know what there's a whole nother eight hours at night that affect how we're doing during the day so when we talk about your patients or yourself we need to focus on are you getting good quality sleep and enough sleep so when we talk about the big thing in society, it's called sleep deprivation. Let me ask a question, because those who know me know I love asking questions. How many hours of sleep do we hope to get per night? And the answer will be seven to eight hours, according to the American Academy of Sleep and Medicine. So I already can see everyone, they're rolling their eyes, I'm not getting that, and I know that everyone knows someone who gets less sleep and does well, and people will need a little bit more. And the key thing is sleep is very individualized and that not everyone is gonna have problems during the day, which is why if you're asking me what I do as a sleep physician, I treat your symptoms during the day. So when we talk about sleep deprivation, can you imagine this? Starting from when we talk about decades ago, when we talk about our baby boomers, they were getting around seven to eight hours of sleep, but now progressing to generation X, now going to the millennials, you know what happened to total sleep time? It's now six to seven hours a night. And who knows what's gonna happen when we do this interview again in 50 years, is total sleep time gonna be five to six hours? That's scary. So what are the manifestations of being sleep deprived? I always say, you tell me the organ and I'll tell you what happens. So when you're sleep deprived, what happens? You get an increase in these stress hormones. What are those hormones, everyone? How about cortisol, norepinephrine, dopamine? And when these stress hormone goes up, tell me everyone what happens to your blood pressure? It goes up. And when you have high blood pressure, is that a risk for heart disease? Um, yes, the most common. And how about when you have high levels of stress hormones? What happens to your blood sugar, your blood glucose? It goes up. And I'll tell you one thing, that leads to what? Diabetes. And diabetes is the most deadliest risk factor when we talk about heart disease. But how something uh, a little more to home. When you are sleep deprived, you get cognitive impairment. How about decision-making? How about that split decision decision-making when you take your test? How about accuracy? How about memory? And how much do we need our memory with us when we take that test? How about this one, everyone? When you are sleep deprived, is, is anyone surprised that it affects your immune system? How many times did you wake up in the morning ready to study, but all of a sudden you get that tickle in your throat, and next thing you know, you had that runny nose. There have been studies that have shown when you are sleep deprived, your immune system is low. And you know that we need to be on our A game and healthy if we're gonna pass that USMLE. And not to mention just overall mood. And I unfortunately see a lot of patients with insomnia and is sleep deprivation and insomnia associated with depression? Yes. And the question is always chicken and the egg. What came first, your sleep problems that made you depressed? Or are you depressed because you can't sleep? And now let me throw another USMLE pearl out there the medications we use for depression, such as what? SSRIs like Prozac and Paxil and Zoloft. You know what the number one side effect of those drugs are? Insomnia. So you can imagine there are many reasons why sleep is such an important part. Now, let me just say this so people could pound home the point about how bad it is to be sleep deprived. Did you know that if you are going to be sleep deprived, that the legal limit for alcohol in California, driving, is gonna be less than 0 0.08. But if you are 17 plus hours of sleep deprivation, that's having a blood alcohol level of almost 0.1. That's how scary it is. Whether it's gonna be for safety for you, for others, or just being on your A game for passing the board exams. 
So let me just say this, is that when we talk about why are we so deprived, it's because throughout the week, we uh, accumulate what's called a sleep debt, which means that we want seven, eight hours, but you know what happens on Monday? We're deprived one hour or two hours. That accumulates to Tuesday, to Thursday, to Friday. And the only way you can make up the sleep debt is by sleeping in that much extra time. And who has that? No one. Then unfortunately, what happens on Saturday? You sleep in later, don't you? You sleep in later. And you know what they call that? Social jet lag. <laughs> and you know what happens on Sunday night when you want to go to bed on time? You don't. Then you're sleep deprived on money and the whole cycle starts over again. So this is something that we need to talk about. So if you were to ask me, well, what are the signs of being sleep deprived? Let me just mention a couple of them. How about sleep attack? How about when you, you're, you're uh, watching a lecture online or you're with uh, a live lecture and all of a sudden maybe the lecture gets a little smidgen boring you start doing this? Sleep attack. Or how about you're trying to take notes and you fall asleep and you fall asleep and you, you keep on writing. That's called automatic behavior. So there are a lot of signs and inappropriate napping. I know we always think it's cute when someone home, comes home from work and sleeps on the couch. It's not cute. You should be sleeping on the couch. These patients are probably very, very sleep deprived. So when we talk about why aren't we sleeping, well, there's not enough time in this Facebook podcast, whatever we call this, to talk about why are we sleeping. I'll tell you a few things for sleep hygiene. So what does sleep hygiene mean? Let me give you some broad things in the limited time we have together. You want to have what's called sleep restriction. It means a set bedtime and a set wake time. Easier said than done because we have families and lives and USMLEs to study for. It's hard to actually do that, but you should. How about something called stimulus control, which means the bed. It's only meant for one thing. And what is that? sleeping. If you can actually fall asleep within the first 15 to 20 minutes, you should leave the bed and do things that are non-stimulating in dim light. But the problem is, is technology. Because if I tell my patients, hey, leave the bed and, and read a book, do you think my patients will actually open a library book and read Moby Dick? No, they're going to use their what? Their iPhone, their iPad, which is what we're trying to do is avoid technology. Because be honest out there, I, I, I could see you. How many people sleep in arm's distance of their, their cell phone? So if they get a, a tweet, a Facebook alert, an Instagram, we're always having this Pavlovian reflex to look for our technology. We have to put technology away. And a couple of other things. I can't tell you how many times I have patients that tell me they need a little wine before going to bed. Alcohol. Sure, it knocks you out. That's what alcohol does. You know, it works on our, our GABA receptor for USMLE Step 1 Pearl. But what's the downside of alcohol is multiple awakenings throughout the night. And on top of that, you don't want to keep on going to the bathroom and you know Step 1 Pearl, alcohol inhibits what hormone? ADH. So we're going to the bathroom. And then being a lung doctor, being a pulmonologist, it blows my mind. I have patients that tell me, Dr. Raj, I need a cigarette before going to bed. Oh my God, I don't want to hear the word cigarette, but I kind of laugh on the inside because nicotine is a what? Stimulant. And when we talk about eating and drinking, I'm not telling go to bed dehydrated. I'm not saying go to bed hungry, but if you eat too late, what happens? You got it, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And of course, if you're drinking too much, many, many trips to the bathroom. So this is only going to be some of the things, but it behooves me to say that if you or a loved one or someone you know is sleeping seven to eight hours and still very fatigued and tired during the day, then you have to ask yourself the question, is that person getting good quality sleep? And 15 to 20 million Americans in our country have what sleep disorder? Obstructive sleep apnea. So remember that. But let me circle around and go back to why you're here tonight to say, what are some tips beyond everything in general preparing for the exam? What should I do the day of the exam? As many of you guys are going to be taking that or other exams in the future, the shelf, the step two, the step three, the IM board exams. So a couple things. Number one, get a good night's rest. That is always going to be the most important the night before. Eat a healthy breakfast. That is going to be very, very, very important and not too much caffeine. Why caffeine dehydrates you? Caffeine will not put you in that good state of mind. So not too much caffeine. During the day of the exam, dress 
comfortably. You want to be in a nice, relaxed mode. You're going to be sitting in front of that computer for quite a long period of time. Please dress comfortably. Of course, arrive early. Don't be stressed before taking the exam. Know where the parking is. Know how you check in. Do these things in advance. Definitely use the bathroom before taking or starting your test. And if they give you a break opportunity, you will take it. And last but not least, the lunch. Don't eat a big lunch for a couple reasons. Number one, our circadian rhythm. You know that around 12 to noon, you're gonna start feeling sleepy again. And depending on that big lunch, I can think of one amino acid. Can you trip the fan? We do not need to be sleepy during that exam. And just in case the night before you're thinking, you know what, Dr. Raj, I'm going to get some good sleep. Maybe that'll be a good time to start my Ambien, Sonata, Lunesta, a horrible idea. No sleeping aids. So sorry we only have a little time together, but I hope I gave you enough pearls and wisdom of how important sleep is. I wish you the best on your exams, and I hope to see you in a Kaplan class soon. I'm Dr. Raj, educating you today for a better outcome tomorrow.